This video is brought to you by Mubi, and of course, by my lovely patrons. Introducing Emo Goth Revival Barbie, now available at Hot Topic. There are already some awesome video essays on Barbie. One of my favorite things about the film has been listening to my friends and colleagues discuss its strengths and weaknesses, like Broy De Chanel and Jesse Gender's videos, or Yahara and Khadija's videos about the ridiculous Oscar discourse. Like femininity itself, everyone has their own beautiful take on what the film means. But there was one thing that I kept waiting for people to talk about, and it never came. So here I am making a video about Barbie and Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I'm emo goth revival Barbie. Greta Gerwig is a filmmaker who is in love with films. Listening to her talk about her inspirations for creating the world of Barbie is just a delight. I remember making um, moving shoebox dioramas where I had the background on pencils that I could roll. And I felt so satisfied by this like thing that was static, but created the sense of movement. And they made like the little sets with the three planes of movement that could show us what it could be. She is extremely cinema literate. So it's no surprise that Barbie has some savvy film references. There are obvious ones like the bit about men explaining the Godfather. This movie is a rich blend of Coppola's aesthetic genius and a triumph to Robert Evans and the architecture of the 70s studio system. But also this man is wrong. The Godfather is about capitalism. And you know who told me that? The Walter Murch. And even the Godfather, he turned it into a critique of American capitalism. Oh great, now I'm explaining the Godfather. Barbie also references the 70s feminist classic, The Stepford Wives. If you're going to tell me you don't like this dress, I'm sticking my head right in the oven. They bought it for me for the weekend. How about the shape? Barbie is larger than life. As the film points out, she is an object which carries both the gift and the curse of being a symbol of femininity in a sexist society. So naturally, a film like this has a lot to say about the patron saint of film bros, oh captain, my captain, Stanley Kubrick. There was something funny to me in that like, He's also the paragon of a certain type of, you know, masculine filmmaking. Let's quickly go through the checklist of Kubrick references. The opening is a reference to 2001, but we'll come back to that later. And within that reference is a reference to Lolita. The doll and the mom are shining. Hello? Are you two like shining? Barbie meets a godlike creator in a liminal space in the same way Dave is transported to a liminal space by godlike creators. Ken being seduced by the patriarchy is a barrage of images like Clockwork Orange. <laughs> Plus there's the overall Palladian shot compositions. But references to Kubrick aren't just peppered throughout the movie. Greta is engaging in a deep conversation with Kubrick's work. Greta based the Mattel boardroom off of the Dr. Strangelove war room. In that film, a bunch of men sit around and essentially plot the destruction of the planet and all humans on it, despite being a bunch of clowns. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room. And they're actually perfectly okay with nuclear annihilation, as long as they get to survive in underground bunkers with plenty of fertile women they can breed with. That's literally in the text. The women will have to be selected for their sexual characteristics which will have to be of a highly stimulating nature. I must confess, you have an astonishingly good idea there, Doctor. And in the same way, the Mattel board members are perfectly happy constructing a version of womanhood, or even feminism, that places women in boxes. Literal boxes. No matter how many girls and women and non-binary and gender non-conforming people they hurt in the process. Also, can we just stop for a moment and appreciate the Warner Brothers logo and the Hollywood sign in the background of the boardroom's windows? Greta isn't just implicating Mattel here, but the very studio she's working for and Hollywood as a whole as a machine that creates unrealistic symbols of femininity and masculinity that women and men and everyone are inevitably compared to. Also, the, uh, upsettingly casual reference to smallpox. Oh my god, this is like in the 1500s with the indigenous people in smallpox. They had no defenses against it. Did remind me of Kubrick's backstory for the Overlook Hotel in The Shining. 
The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. I didn't like Kubrick using genocide as background for his film, and I don't like Greta using genocide as an offhand comment in hers. While not every reference works for me, she's clearly drawing from Kubrick's monolithic body of work. So I think this begs the question, why would this hyper-feminine film pull inspiration from the Stelle Kubrick? Well, Greta and Kubrick are both directors who explore the ways that media and the plastic world we're born into impacts everything from the way we dress, to the shape of our government, to how good our relationship is with our mothers, to the way we view ourselves. glimpse we get of Barbie is the 2001 style intro, which was heavily featured in the trailer. 2001 is one of the most iconic and influential films ever made, so it makes sense that this scene is also one of the most parodied ever. Just off the top of my head, there's Zoolander, <laughs> this terrible Leslie Nielsen movie, shut up you stupid monkey. The latest Nathan Fielder show, The Curse, but I won't say any more because I don't want to spoil it for you. And Clueless, when the soundtrack plays as we view Cher's phone from an angle that makes it look like the monolith. Christian said he'd call the next day, but in boy time that meant Thursday. I didn't even realize Barbie isn't the first coming of age film to parody 2001 about an idealized blonde woman who starts off the narrative living a sheltered, perfect life only to realize that she is part of a whole world outside, leading her to become a real person. And that's film history. But Greta uses this reference to set up the themes of the film, and with a keen eye for detail and authenticity. She actually got permission to use Kubrick's original front projection plates of prehistoric Earth from the production of 2001. Kubrick utilized the most advanced production techniques of his time, but that technology didn't give Greta the flexibility that she wanted. To fix this, Greta used a volume stage developed by Industrial Light and Magic, allowing her to combine practical elements like actors and props with an LED backdrop displaying Kubrick's plates. She seamlessly combined Kubrick's original plates with cutting edge technology. Kubrick would have creamed himself. In Kubrick's original film, the monolith is a fetish object. Not in the fun way, but in the original not fun way. A fetish object is anything that we attribute inherent, non-material value or powers to. But one of the most common interpretations of the monolith is supported by the larger body of Kubrick's work. And the gist of that is that the monolith itself is a blank space, onto which we, the audience, project meaning. It's the screen in a darkened theater. It's that void that we stare into in the shower, filling it with our desires, fears, preconceptions, dreams. It's the ultimate fetish object, in the not fun way, in that it really isn't anything besides a black box, so it becomes whatever we make of it. To put it simply, the monolith itself is a blank space onto which we, the audience, project meaning. Kubrick also makes a direct connection between the monolith and technology. In 2001, the monolith appears at various stages in human evolution, coinciding with major technological advancements, from the first human to use a tool, to humanity's journey into space and beyond the stars. But according to Kubrick's vision, with technology comes violence. In the film, tools quickly become something else entirely when put in the hands of a human, a weapon. In the opening sequence, the bone becomes a club as the apes kill each other to form the world's first Kazumojo Dojo house. So anyways, Barbie. In this opening, Greta places Barbie as the monolith, which is kind of perfect. The history of dolls as a concept is as old as humanity, the first being used as far back as the Paleolithic era. Dolls are a blank space where we can project meaning. As kids, we fill them with our own desires, fears, preconceptions, dreams. Dolls are a fetish object in that they really aren't anything more than a plastic toy. Marketing departments try to tell us what their dolls mean. Parents project their own feelings onto them. But in the hands of a kid, they become kind of whatever that kid makes of them. I prefer stuffed animals, but to each their own. In the film, we see the mom's feelings influence her Barbies. Because as kids, we use our dolls to express our feelings and help process things that might happen in this big world we're trying to be a part of. But here's where things start to become complicated. Because Barbie is not just a doll. She is a woman doll. 
Women have traditionally been marginalized by society through dehumanization, and more specifically, perceiving and treating them as an object. And that is a huge generalization, but speaking more directly about filmmaking, women have been traditionally framed as the object of film, whereas men are traditionally framed as the subject. So at the beginning of the film, we see Barbie larger than life as the monolithic object, both an actual object, because she's a doll, and a woman, who is more often going to be perceived by others as an object instead of a human being. And of course, bringing white supremacy into the mix, Barbie was created in the image of a skinny, white, idealized blonde woman. She was designed in a white supremacist society, and that whiteness is what signaled to consumers that she could be, quote unquote, anything. Because whiteness is seen as the default. So as a monolithic symbol, Barbie is what we project onto her. She is empowerment. She is shallow. She is disproportional. If she were real, she wouldn't be able to stand with feet like that. She is a fascist. Barbie the doll is what we create her to be. And Barbie, the brand, is also subjected to this ever-changing negotiation of what it means. It means one thing to the marketing department. And when you think of Sparkle, what do you think of after that? Female agency. Another to parents who love or hate her. And an entirely different thing to the kids who play with or destroy her. Since the brand was founded in 1959 by Ruth Handler, Barbie, like the monolith, has been a touchstone for cultural evolution, from the sexual revolution, the new Barbie twist, to the feminist movement, acting more like a real teenager than ever before, to the materialism of the 1980s. The furnished Barbie glamour home is three stories tall, has a porch swing and all this. She has moved beyond her physical form as a plastic toy and into the realm of cultural fabric, as recognizable as the theme from 2001. Through the decades, Barbie has always tried to capture whatever femininity meant at the time. Whether that meant women getting jobs, getting pregnant, or going to space. And through the decades, Barbie has also been held up as an example of what's wrong with femininity. That women are inherently shallow, overly sexual, materialistic. In other words, Barbie bad. When adults point to Barbie as simply bad, as the singular signifier for the evils of marketing, or the failures of second wave feminism, or as the only source of body image issues, we ignore the realities of how kids play with Barbie. Kids don't have that same adult baggage, so they're not projecting those same ideas onto her. Unless we saddle them with that baggage. And this changing idea of femininity is often a source of conflict between mothers and daughters. A generation gap between two women also includes a gap in how they express their ideas of what it means to be a woman. Kids are not the only ones who use dolls as a way to express themselves. Adults project their thoughts, anxieties, and prejudices onto toys, as well as onto the children who may or may not play with them. And my mom didn't like Barbie. My mom doesn't like lots of things. Um, <laughs> Barbie was like emblematic. Like we weren't allowed to wear like logos on our shirts because she was like, why would you advertise? Why would you be a billboard for a company? She was staunch and she was correct. We end up placing a lot of our personal thoughts and feelings around femininity onto this plastic object. And by extension, the kids who are inclined to pick it up from the toy aisle. Both because that is her purpose as a toy, but also because she is a signifier of femininity, one of society's favorite things to project onto, label, and control. Misogyny is an overwhelming and pervasive status quo. Fighting against it can feel impossible. So at times, we look for symbols to attack. And as a monolith, Barbie becomes the perfect windmill. Again, I'm not defending the brand Barbie. I am just thinking critically about how we talk about the idea of Barbie. I have a formative memory of playing with my older sister when we were younger, who now is an out trans woman, but at the time was not. We had just played with Thomas the Tank Engine, so I asked if she wanted to play Barbies with me. And her face fell. And she told me, well, boys aren't supposed to play with Barbie. Even though I could tell she really wanted to. And as a kid, I felt confused and sad. I was sad that she was sad, and I was confused 
as to why she felt like she couldn't play with something that clearly she wanted to. So we did end up playing together, but she told me that I wasn't supposed to tell anybody. And I don't even think she remembers this. Now as an adult, uh, now I found out it was actually Polly Pocket that she really wanted to collect. But besides the point. The way that some people talk about Barbie dolls and the Barbie movie often makes it sound like they think kids are just unthinking drones who do nothing but regurgitate Mattel marketing slogans or subscribe to the most harmful self-hating misogynist stereotypes. And to me, this could often tip into a re-infantilization of little girls and how they use their imaginations. Kids are complex people with complex emotions. Kids often see the contradictions within marketing and don't play with toys in the ways we expect them to. Weird Barbie got one of the biggest laughs of the whole movie because she's instantly recognizable. Were people up in arms about the G.I. Joe movie and how it'll brainwash little boys into signing up for the army as soon as they turn 18? All of these contradictory attitudes about the monolith Barbie are expressed through the other characters in the film. The mom sees Barbie as comfort. The daughter sees Barbie as evil. Kids see Barbie as cheap meat for their Roborex to eat. The world sees Barbie as a sex object. Mattel sees Barbie as a commodity. The film tells us that Ruth Handler's initial intent was to give girls a toy to play with that didn't just pigeonhole them as future mothers and baby factories. But of course, Barbie is a hyper-feminine, white, blonde, leggy gal who became a monolith for our ideas of femininity because we live in a white supremacist, patriarchal society. In 2001, the technology put forth by the monolith, the bone, is thrown into the air and becomes a nuclear weapons platform. With that edit, Kubrick is commenting on our relationship with technology and our tendency to use technological advancements to destroy one another. When Greta parodies this edit by placing a baby doll in place of a bone and the Barbie logo in place of a nuclear weapons platform, She's highlighting the way that we use symbols like Barbie, both as a tool and also a weapon. At its best, Barbie is a tool that lets girls envision their own future. But at its worst, Barbie is a nuclear weapon pointed directly at those same girls, telling them that everything they like is wrong. The name Barbie itself has become associated with dumb blondes, a monolith for the inherent inferiority of women. Despite these societal structures being created by and primarily benefiting the patriarchy, the negative criticisms about Barbie aren't always aimed at the conditions that created her. Instead, these criticisms very often get directed back at girls, whether or not they even like Barbie in the first place. The overly simplistic version of girl boss feminism that Barbie believes has liberated all little girls in the real world is the very ideology that has failed the girls of the real world. In my experience growing up as a cis girl, you learn real fast that playing with Barbies is shameful and makes you a shallow, materialistic cunt. I once got a Barbie from my grandmother for Christmas. My first thought was, wow, she doesn't know me at all. And then I thought, uh, what a cunt thing to think. That's not her job to know what toys you're currently playing with. Now go hug her. My grandma saw that Barbie and thought of her young granddaughter. I saw that Barbie and thought of the gap between that Barbie and me. Because even at six years old, I was already being judged based on a whole list of things that had nothing to do with me as a human being. A real life monolith. It's not my grandmother's fault that she thought that I would have liked a Barbie. That toy was already a loaded weapon. I could already tell that I was perceived differently than my male classmates. I knew that my appearance meant something to other people that it certainly did not mean to me. All for reasons that I just could not figure out and wouldn't figure out till way later in life. I just knew the less girly I acted, the more people treated me like a human being. But also the less girly I acted, the less I felt like myself. And this toy became a symbol for all of those anxieties and so much more. Patriarchal structures hurt everyone, including men. A disco version of 2001's iconic theme plays when Ken visits the real world and discovers male supremacy. <laughs> Patriarchy is the tool, the weapon, that Ken is evolving to understand and wield against his enemies. Just as the pre-humans evolved to understand and wield the bone. And just as nuclear proliferation threatened to destroy Earth during the Cold War, patriarchy threatens to destroy the utopia of Barbie Land when Ken brings it back with him. 
Now, I don't want to use Kubrick's work to validate Barbie. Barbie isn't compelling because it references an auteur like Kubrick. It's compelling because Greta is also interested in the power of these monolithic, symbolic images. Both directors frequently examine the themes of conforming or rebelling against a perceived image. Whether it's the women in Little Women conforming to or rebelling against the image of womanhood, or Barry Lyndon conforming to or rebelling against his societal station. Both directors recognize the contradictory violence and validation that an idol can create in ourselves. But Kubrick had one fatal flaw. He was a man, lost in the sauce of masculinity. Much of Kubrick's work concerns itself with masculinity and how it functions in our world. His interpretation of masculinity is centered on violence, power, and voyeurism. In each time period, the people in power and the people the narrative focuses on all just happen to be men. And he loves using a good old fashioned phallic object to represent power. That's a dick. That's a dick. That's a dick. That's a dick. Kubrick envisions the world as a man's world, filled with masculine symbols of power, which, let's not lie to ourselves, is one of the reasons film bros are so wet for this man. After all, what is masculine is universal, and what is feminine should be kept way, 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 way over there. Nope, further, further away. Don't look at me, put it down, walk away. Kubrick was fascinated with female characters, and particularly the way that men objectify and perceive them. You just start your countdown, and old Bucky will be back here before you can say, blast off! But that still places the viewer at a distance from them, because women are human beings on the inside, not simply the image that men perceive them to be. Kubrick stories usually view women at a distance, rarely asking the audience to identify with them, but instead to identify with the viewer, the perceiver. For all intents and purposes, the man. Lolita is probably the biggest example of Kubrick's failures when it comes to portraying women or capturing a feminine point of view. The point of the novel is very much to interrogate the way that men dominate, twist, and manipulate narratives about women. But Kubrick pretty much does away with the framing device that makes those themes land. His film ends up falling into the exact viewpoint that Nabokov's novel was originally trying to skewer. Kubrick's point of view was firmly planted on one side of the gender binary. And on top of that, the history of film criticism has also been unfairly dominated by men. So interpretations of Kubrick's interpretations of masculinity are also most often analyzed through a masculine lens. There is semen all over this microscope. But rather than just gender swapping Kubrick's rubric, TM, Greta transcends his work by crafting a deeply compelling female lead in Barbie, as well as a deeply compelling male lead in Ken. Ken has the more traditional hero's journey arc. He leaves his home, Barbie land, crosses the threshold into the real world, enters his innermost cave of his Casa Mojo Dojo house, has an ordeal, only to pull through as a better version of himself. He's just Ken, and he is Knuff. But Barbie's journey resembles more of the carrier bag theory of fiction, as Ursula Le Guin described in her essay of the same name. She proposed that the first tool wasn't a spear or weapon, like Kubrick illustrates in 2001, but it was actually a bag, a thing to carry things. And this makes sense, as we now know that the first humans were gatherers before they were hunters. In the context of fiction, Le Guin argues against the phallic fetishization of the weapon and a singular noble hero. Instead, the carrier bag is more about our collective experiences and community. It's messy and complicated. No one protagonist is perfect. The characters bump and jumble into one another. In the essay, we should all be reading more Ursula Le Guin, Siobhan Luddy writes, not only is the carrier bag theory plausible, it also does meaningful ideological work. Shifting the way we look at humanity's foundations from a narrative of domination to one of gathering, holding, and sharing. Barbie begins the narrative like any other near middle class white girl. When you're young and born into the gender you identify as, your youngest years are filled with gender euphoria. Being a girl is awesome. Zero downsides, 10 out of 10, would do again. But sooner or later, and usually sooner, you are thrust into a world that suddenly does not agree. You find out the patriarchy has politicized your performance of gender, and the fantasy of your fictional bubbly world is popped. 
real world isn't what I thought it was. For a lot of us who want to rebel against that rigid gender binary we've been tossed into, this is where the not like other girls phase takes place. Sarah Zed has a great video on the topic. When Barbie enters our world like a little girl growing up, she discovers that she's carrying a truckload of baggage that she had no idea she was lugging around. She is that monolith and therefore carries all of our notions about womanhood, femininity, gender constructs, misogyny. It's a lot to handle. I don't control the railways or the flow of commerce. When Barbie first encounters how the world views someone like her, she's so traumatized. And there's no undertone of violence. Mine very much has an undertone of violence. She considers getting back into the safety of her box. Get into the box and you'll go back to Barbie land and everything will be as it was. And then she runs away back to her plastic childhood fantasy. Barbie's character arc is her slowly going through the bag she carries and discovering who she is to herself and discarding the ideas that others have tried to place on her. She is a Stepford wife, deprogramming herself. Like quite literally, the Barbies get deprogrammed in a reverse Stepford wife sequence. And whatever your thoughts on the movie are, I think this is why the film resonates with so many people and not just women. My dad cried. Well, actually he cries at every movie, so that's not a good example. My mom cried. She cries at nothing especially in late stage capitalism, which tries to sell us objects in order to define who we are. Every one of us has to go through our own bags. You have to pull out the false assumptions that others have placed upon you and discover who you actually are, what makes you happy, what your gender identity is, what your sexual identity is. America's monologue speaks directly to this. Her speech illustrates all the things that women are expected to carry, whether they asked for it or not. Kubrick's 2001 begins with the invention of human weapons and ends with the hopeful idea that we will evolve past our tendency to use those weapons to destroy one another. In Barbie, we start with a highly gendered, meticulously crafted world and end with Barbie giving it all up in order to become an imperfect, messy, flat-footed person. She looks through her pink carrier bag and decides that her previous life full of things and outfits and stuff isn't as important as experiencing humanity of feeling. She will grow old, get cellulite, and eventually die. But to her, the trade is worth it because there is a promise to be more deeply connected to the people in the world around her. That felt achy, but good. It's about evolving beyond superficiality to experience something deeper. But while the film is asking all of us to shed that superficiality, many of the criticisms of the movie feel kind of superficial. People have complained that the montage at the end is just stock footage Barbie commercial B-roll, but it's actually home videos from the cast and crew, the people who poured their lives into the project. It's extremely personal to the people who made it. The criticism that it's Feminism 101 is valid but uh, I didn't get a gender studies class until my sophomore year at university. So, you know, I think having a film that could spark a discussion and awareness much earlier is great. I also think it's offering much more than Feminism 101. It's offering a way to look at yourself in a kinder, more humanistic lens. And while the literal dialogue might be Feminism 101, the cinematic language is beautifully complex and respects the audience's intelligence. And on that note, to think a woman or girl or anyone introduced to these ideas through the movie wouldn't be spurred to discover or learn more about it afterwards is just reductive and dismissive. That's not how people is. And there's the criticism that this film didn't end patriarchy and that is right, it didn't. And also that is the first joke that the movie makes that Barbie didn't and can't. I feel left out of Barbie land. Good, you are supposed to. None of us are Barbie, not even Barbie. That's the point of the film that we should be divesting ourselves from some nebulous and disingenuous and oftentimes misogynistic and white supremacist idea of suburban perfection. None of these characters measure up. And so she leaves. And then there's the criticism that this is just one huge ad for Mattel, which yeah, of course, and the Sistine Chapel is a commercial for Catholicism. But while Mattel's quarterly sales did increase by 16%, in the wake of the Mario movie, Nintendo's quarterly sales skyrocketed 50%. But the tone of the discourse around the Mario movie is nowhere near the same. 
and Nintendo is notorious for its terrible business practices. The disproportionate response reminds me of Natalie Wynn's latest video about Twilight. The policing and fear-mongering about women consuming the right or wrong type of media. As if buying a girl the right type of doll will end misogyny. As if we can consume our way out of this hellhole. If that were the case, then Monster High would be owed a Nobel Peace Prize. Here's where I'm going to get very vulnerable. My name is Maggie Mae Fish, and uh, I didn't particularly uh, like Lady Bird, but I did like the Barbie movie. I liked it a lot. But what I loved about the Barbie movie was watching how other people loved it. But for it to strike such an emotionally deep chord for so many people, I think we owe it to them to ask why. And I think the emotions that Billie Eilish's song evokes conveys a lot of that why. When 2001 came out, Kubrick's Russian counterpart, Andrei Tarkovsky, criticized his work for lacking emotion. Tarkovsky released Solaris, partly as a response to 2001. Whereas Kubrick created a cold world with perfect technology, Tarkovsky wanted to depict a lived-in world, where humans and their emotions were the centerpiece. And Greta's imagery of Barbie feeling the world around her is a powerful homage to Solaris, where the protagonist, Chris, wanders meditatively through nature as he questions his own identity and existence. These pastoral scenes are contrasted to the artificiality of the space station, just as the scenes of Barbie in the park are juxtaposed with the plastic world of Barbie land. In Solaris, the main character meets a simulation of his dead wife, Hari. But according to the men on the space station, she isn't real. А вы, вы только ее повторение, механическое повторение, копия, матрица. She was created from Chris's memories of her. Her only existence is how she is perceived by him. She has no memories of her own. She's the image of his wife, a monolith, a fetish object projected from Chris's memories, anxieties, and regrets. But against all odds, and what the man scientist said, Hari wills herself into becoming human. And she does it by feeling. In doing so, she realizes that she no longer needs the gaze of her male counterpart to validate her existence. Also, Solaris has one of the most Barbie outfits I have ever seen. Also, also, someone please, Make me that dress. In Solaris, as in Barbie, what makes us truly human is not our superficial physical form or our place within a gender binary or the ideas that other people project onto us. Instead, it's our capacity to determine our own identity, to self-actualize, and maybe most importantly of all, to feel. Barbie tells her creator, I wanna be a part of the people that make meaning not the thing that's made. She decides to no longer be the object, but instead the subject. And it's not just a role reversal where Ken becomes the object. It's an evolution of how we should view one another. Greta herself started as an actress, the traditional object of a story, but is now its author. In just a minute, I'm gonna give some final closing thoughts, but first here's a quick word from Mubi, the sponsor of this video. For me, one of the best ways to get to know a filmmaker is by looking back at their early work. So I'm excited to check out Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach's earlier collaboration, Francis Ha, on Mubi. It's the quintessential 2010s indie film. Mubi's curation is top notch, and it's one of the few streaming film sites where the descriptions and reviews are actually helpful. Now finding something to watch is easy, instead of exhausting, because every time I log on, there are new gems to discover right on the homepage. Whether you're a movie newbie or a certified film buff, Mubi is a great way to find hand-picked filmmaker retrospectives, double features, and iconic indies. So sign up at movie.com slash mmfish. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash mmfish. And get your month of great cinema for free. So anyway, I do think this movie had a lot to say and it managed to say it while making a packed audience laugh. 
which to me is actually the most revolutionary part of all of this. I wish I could have just made a video essay about that. I do think it's interesting that when women use humor to illustrate a point, it's often brushed aside as flippant. But when men use humor to illustrate a point, it only highlights what a genius we already knew they were. What Dr. Strangelove did for the atomic bomb, I think Barbie does in regards to skewering patriarchal structures. It's just horses all the way down. In a world where images are so powerful, for better or worse, how do we free ourselves from being defined by them? Well, we can close our eyes and embrace our humanity, contradictions, flat feet, and all. Others will try to define us, but inside, we do have the power to define ourselves, to decide what we will carry around and what we won't. I'm a bitch. I'm a lover. I'm a child. I'm a mother. You get it. But hey, you don't have to read the Barbie movie like that. I'm just really dark and deep, so. Emo goth revival Barbie. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching the video. Thank you to everyone watching over on Nebula. And an extra special thank you to all of my patrons. They're the reason that I get to create these videos. And especially for this one, getting their feedback before posting to the world was so extremely helpful. In April, I'm launching a new video podcast called Lynchpins with my friend Adam Ganser, all about the films of David Lynch. And as a special treat, patrons will be getting the extended version of each episode a full week early. And you can join in on the fun for as little as a dollar a month. You'll also get access to my lovely chill Discord that has some of the best film recommendations. You are all a treasure trove of film connoisseurs, and I love you for that. So please join us if you can, and be sure to subscribe, hit the like button, click the bell, and comment below with what type of Barbie, Ken, Alan, or Monster High character you feel like today. Until next time, save Martha. Except she doesn't need saving because she just self-actualized, baby.